Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3, 2001, and under previous order of the House, the following members are recognized for five minutes each. Let me go through all. Mr. Paul of Texas. Gentlemen, we'll suspend for one second. House will be in order. Gentlemen, Texas is recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the war drums are beating louder and louder. Iraq, Iran, and North Korea have been forewarned. Plans have been laid and, for all we know, already initiated for the overthrow and assassination of Saddam Hussein. There's been talk of sabotage, psychological warfare, arming domestic rebels, killing Hussein, and even an outright invasion of Iraq with hundreds of thousands of U.S. troops. All we hear about in the biased media is the need to eliminate Saddam Hussein with little regard of how this in itself might totally destabilize the entire Middle East and Central Asia. It could, in fact, make the Iraqi problem much worse. The assumption is that with our success in Afghanistan, we should now pursue this same policy against any country we choose, no matter how flimsy the justification. It hardly can be argued that it's because of authoritarian governments deserve our wrath, considering the number of current and past such governments that we have not only tolerated but subsidized. Protestations from our Arab allies are silenced by our dumping of more American taxpayers' dollars on them. European criticism that the U.S. is now following a unilateral approach is brushed off by the United States, which only causes more apprehension in the European community. Widespread support from the eager media pumps the public to support the warmongers in the administration. The pros and cons of how dangerous Saddam Hussein actually is are legitimate. However, it's rarely pointed out that the CIA has found no evidence whatsoever that Iraq has, was involved in the terrorist attack of 9-11. Rarely do we hear that Iraq has never committed any aggression against the United States. No one in the media questions our aggression against Iraq for the past 12 years by continuous bombing and imposed sanctions responsible for the death of hundreds of thousands of children in Iraq. The Iraqi defense of their homeland can hardly be characterized as aggression against those who rain bombs down on them. We had to go over 6,000 miles to pick this fight against a third world nation with little ability to defend itself. Our policies have actually served to generate support for Saddam Hussein in spite of his brutal control of the Iraqi people. He is as strong today, if not stronger, as he was prior to the Persian Gulf War 12 years ago. Even today, our jingoism, ironically, is driving a closer alliance between Iraq and Iran, long-time bitter enemies. While we trade with and subsidize to the hilt the questionable government of China, we place sanctions on and refuse to trade with Iran and Iraq, which only causes greater antagonism. But if the warmonger's goal is to have a war, regardless of international law and the Constitution, current policy serves their interests. Could it be that only by war and removal of certain governments we can maintain control of the oil in this region? Could it be all about oil and have nothing to do with U.S. national security? Too often when we dictate who will lead another country, we only replace one group of thugs with another, as we just did in Afghanistan, with the only difference being that the thugs who support, we support are expected to be puppet-like and remain loyal to the United States or else. Although bits and pieces of the administration's plans to wage war against Iraq and possibly Iran and North Korea are garnered, we never hear any mention of the authority to do so. It seems that Tony Blair's approval is more important than the approval of the American people. Congress never complains about its lost prerogatives to be the sole uh, declarer of war. Astoundingly, Congress is only too eager to give war uh, to give war to give war powers to our presidents through the back door by the use of some fuzzy resolution that the president can use as his justification. And once the hostilities begin, the money always follows because Congress fears criticism for not supporting the troops. But putting troops in harm's way without proper authority and unnecessarily can hardly be the way to support the troops. 
Let it be clearly understood, there is no authority to wage war against Iraq without the Congress passing a declaration of war. H.J. Res. 65, passed in the aftermath of 9-11, does not even suggest that this authority exists. A U.N. resolution authorizing the Iraqi invasion, even if it were to come, cannot replace the legal process for the United States going to war as precisely defined in the Constitution. We must remember a covert war is no more justifiable and is even more reprehensible. Only tyrants can take a nation to war without the consent of the people. The planned war against Iraq without a declaration of war is illegal. It is unwise because of the many unforeseen consequences that are likely to result. It is immoral and unjust because it has nothing to do with U.S. security and because Iraq has not initiated aggression against us. And besides, the American people become less secure when we risk a major conflict driven by commercial interests and not authorized in a proper manner by the Congress. Victory under these circumstances is always elusive, and unintended consequences are inevitable. And I yield back. Thank you. I'd like to recognize Mr. George Miller from California, who's recognized for five minutes.